Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sustainable Scoop. Our agenda for 2020 is to focus on durability. With cities making plans for the future and with so much money being invested, we have heard from many young viewers who want to better understand green buildings. And they're asking, how are these buildings going to perform over time? Recently, the Greens of Arlington and Eco Action Arlington sponsored a lecture with Oberlin College professor John Schofield a national expert on U.S. green building certifications. In this program, Professor Schofield will discuss his extensive research on the energy savings and greenhouse gas emissions from LEED buildings. There is a lot of information to go through. Be ready to take notes. I'm here at the Arlington Central Library with Chairman of the Arlington Green Party, John Reeder. We are looking forward to a wonderful event tonight to discuss LEED buildings. Welcome, John. Thank you, Miriam. Why was it so important to have this event here in Arlington? Arlington County t is researching or planning a community energy plan which will g get us to a carbon neutral future within 20 to 25 years. Buildings are a big part of that. So we need to have truly green, that is environmentally friendly, low energy using buildings. And so tell us a little bit about our speaker today and his background. Uh, John Schofield is a professor from an Ohio uh, college, Oberlin College, which is outside of Cleveland. And he's done a lot of primary research on buildings that are LEED certified, actually getting their energy data and comparing them to buildings that, that were not uh, LEED certified. Okay, and so what, you're, what are you hoping to uncover tonight that will guide Arlington's investment in sustainable buildings? So what we have to do in Arlington is come up with a better way to get energy savings from new commercial buildings. And our history in Arlington is that roughly all the buildings are torn down and replaced within 30 years or so in Arlington. So we're constantly adding new buildings so we want the new buildings to truly be uh, buildings of the future. Yes, to be less energy intensive and to, and to help us get to a carbon fr free uh, future. I, uh, I teach physics at Oberlin College and I'm used to speaking in 50 minute chunks of time and I have about an hour and a half of a talk to give you so I will speak fast. Uh, the talk is a lead building performance from municipal energy benchmarking data. I'll say what those words are in a bit. I do want to give some credit to some of my collaborators. The first uh, list there, Jillian Doan, Jacob Cornell, Vicki Zhang, Ken Lang, and Susanna Brodnitz are students at Oberlin College and have worked with me on this research. And then uh, Tom Schofield is a mathematician at Calvin College. First, let me talk about the big picture. What's this all about? Climate change is due to greenhouse gas emission largely from humans. And this is the big problem that we are trying to address. Uh, most of the greenhouse gases, uh, or a large amount of them, come from uh, fossil fuels. 80% of the US energy comes from fossil fuels. And I, I have to show you my favorite chart. This is a US energy flow chart. It's complicated as can be, but I'll walk you through it. It shows energy flow in the US economy. On the left-hand side, well, first of all, up top, in 2018, we used 101 of these units called quads. A quad is a 10 to the 15th BTU. A BTU is about 1,000 joules, and so a quad is 10 to the 18 joules. So we used about 10 to the 20th joules. I don't have a name for that. Uh, it's kind of bigger than quadrillion and, and whatnot, but 10 to 20 joules is how much energy we used in a year. On the left-hand side is primary energy. This is where our energy comes from. It comes from solar, from nuclear, hydro, natural gas, coal, oil, etc. These are ways we harvest energy. And 80% of this, even two years ago, was fossil fuels. It, it, it really is hard to believe, but we continue to live off fossil fuels and will for some time to come. On the right hand side are where this energy is used, what we call the end use sectors, residential buildings, commercial buildings, industry, transportation. 
And this shows you that two-thirds of that energy is actually wasted. Two-thirds is wasted, perhaps even more, but at least two-thirds is wasted. So that's the big picture. In addition to that, U.S. buildings use 40% of this energy, 40% of this energy. And for those of you in Arlington, if you're concerned about your community, your community buildings is a much larger fraction than that. But nationally, it's 40%. And a cornerstone of any plan to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission is to use energy more efficiently, right? The cornerstone is to use it more efficiently and reduce energy that way, and then you can solve the problem with other techniques. And greening buildings is one of the important strategies for reducing energy. There are various green building programs, and the one I'm going to talk about today is called LEAD. So what is LEAD? LEAD stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, it was introduced about 20 years ago by the U.S. Green Building Council. Certification of a building. Uh, is based on points, points that building can earn. Uh, they're in categories of energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, uh, indoor environmental quality, and so on. I'll talk more about those. There are four levels of certification that a building can achieve, actually five. A building may not be certified at all. That's like flunking a course. And then there are four levels that are like four grades. Uh, certified is the lowest level. That's kind of like a D. Silver is a C, gold is a B, and platinum is an A for your building. And there are various systems under which we certify buildings. New construction is the one you think about the most, but there are other ones, core and shell, and there's a lot of existing buildings which can be certified when they're renovated. And the specifics for all of these depend on the system and the version involved. Let me start by showing you a scorecard. This is uh, all the different categories of points you can earn under LEED New Construction Version 4. Down in the right corner, there's 110 total possible points. The largest fraction come in that energy and atmosphere category. 33 of the points can come in that category. And the biggest one thing is really for energy optimization. Uh, it's called parameter EAC1. It, you can get up to 18 points depending on how energy efficient you uh, design your building. And then there are other categories, sustainable sites, uh, water efficiency, materials and resources, indoor environmental quality. And then, of course, many of you heard, you can get a few points if you put in a bike rack or you put in uh, a green parking place. So there are a few of those things that are uh, considered kind of small potatoes. The final grade, if you get up to 49 points, you can be certified. Another 10 points, you can be silver. You have to get up to 79 or as many as 60 to be gold. And then to get the, the coveted platinum award, you have to get 80 or more points. And so those are the different levels you can get certified. Is it possible to get a perfect score? I don't you think anyone ever has. It's very difficult, actually, to get 80. So yeah, it is not, not very easy. Um, I'm from Oberlin College. We have several certified, LEED certified buildings. This is a dormitory that was certified silver. This is uh, a, one of our conservatory buildings built about eight years ago. It's gold certified. And then our most recent addition is the hotel at Oberlin, which was recently certified as platinum. And if I had pictures of your Arlington buildings, I'm sure I could show you a few you know. Let me say a few words about energy optimization. I'm interested in energy savings. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into being lead, but energy for me is the most important because it's tied to carbon emission. In fact, 20 years ago, when this was introduced, no one was really thinking that much about carbon, or at least this wasn't so much about carbon. Today, we think about carbon. There are two ways you can earn these energy efficiency points. One is for a new type building, new construction, core and shell. These are based on simulations that the design team uh, conducts on their computer. Simulations of how much energy they believe their building will use. And they compare those two simulations for a, another less efficient baseline building called the code compliant building. They could build a worse building and so if theirs is much better than the worst building, they get points based on that. The second kind of way to get points is for an existing building 
the existing building operation maintenance program, those are based on the Energy Star score that the building earns in its first year of operation. So those are based on some measured energy performance things. Those are two different ways to get points for being energy efficient. Now many organizations, governments, universities, many organizations have mandated that all new buildings should be lead silver or better. I think in fact about three years ago the federal government upped that to a gold standard for all their new buildings. Uh, the state of Ohio, where I'm from, has helped build at least 365 LEED certified schools, public schools around the state, more by now, and uh, spent hundreds of millions on that. And as of a year ago, there were 25,000 LEED certified commercial buildings um, in the U.S., taking up about 4.3 million or billion gross square feet. That's about 6%. Uh, five, six percent of the commercial building stock. So there's a lot of LEED certified buildings right now. The question that I have, and the question I think that's most important is, do these buildings really save energy and lower greenhouse gas emission? The people who are making them believe they do. The design teams believe they do. But the question is, do they? And how do we know that? How do we test the idea? What metrics do you use to quantify building energy use? And what's your comparison group? If you're going to learn about the energy use of this building, what buildings would you compare it with to see if it's doing well or not? And there's lots of anecdotal evidence. You'll, find, you'll read various uh, case studies put out by design teams of their glorious building. But case studies, just a handful of, of anecdotal evidence is not the same as saying, this is a way that's going to, on average, save energy. You can imagine that if you were trying to get a drug approved, a few antidotal pieces of evidence is not sufficient. You have to do a real robust statistical test. The thing I have to point out is good intentions is not the same as good performance. There is, in the building industry, a well-known gap between the performance of buildings and the projected performance by the design team. There's actually many papers written on the building performance energy gap. It's widespread and it's, it's everywhere, not just for green buildings. It's also very difficult to obtain building energy use data. And I learned this as a scientist. When I study nature, nature doesn't care what I find out. You know, you study trees, you study frogs, they don't write their congressman and say, you know, I don't like this, right? <laughs> building owners care what you find out. And once a building owner has gotten a lot of green publicity and they have this building, they really have a lot to lose if you say something bad about it as opposed to uh, just being quiet. And so it's very difficult in this country to get building energy data. Now since 2009, the US Green Building Council has actually mandated that every LEED certified building from version 2009 on has to provide them with five years of energy data. So there ought to be a lot of energy data out there. There are, there are tens, there are probably at least 12,000 buildings that have been through this newer process. Yet there's never been any publicized report, you know, the data are not made public. So we can't get access to that. This is the key barrier really to understanding building energy performance is getting the energy data, getting the energy data. That's really been the problem. All right, well, before I talk about what we've been doing, uh, I want to talk about kind of just the background. How do you measure building energy? How do you quantify, et cetera? So the standard metric is called the annual site energy. What you need to do is get your hands on the monthly utility bills. You put together uh, how much energy was used in 12 months. Some of it will be in gas, some will be in electric. There'll be other forms too. You need to convert them to a common unit and you find out that's the annual energy used on site. Annual energy used on site. Now, if you're gonna compare two buildings, they rarely have the same size, and it won't come as a surprise to you know that big buildings use more energy than small buildings. So you have to somehow adjust for size, and the regular way to do that is to divide the annual energy used by the total floor area. That's how we measure building size. It's called gross square footage. It's literally a measurement of all the carpet you would use in a building to carpet the floor. It gets a little more complicated, but that's about what it is. So you divide the annual energy use by the floor area, and you have what's called the energy use intensity, or EUI. And, and that is 
the, the typical metric. Now, uh, I'm showing you some numbers here. In, in this country, and only in this country, we use British thermal units to measure energy. Everywhere else in the U, everywhere else they use joules, we use British thermal units. Everywhere else they measure floor area in square meters, we do it in square feet. So in this country, all buildings, the average site EUI for all buildings, commercial buildings, is about 80 kilo BTU, 80,000 BTU per square foot. And for offices, it's a little lower. Offices use a little lower energy than do other, other buildings. The thing about site energy, though, is site energy treats all energies the same. Gas is the same as electric. And now that we're interested in carbon, you know that there ought to be a little bit more drilling down because we want to trace it back to footprint. And policy, energy policy is not really concerned with how much energy you use, but how much energy, how much resources are we using up, particularly fossil fuels, right? It's the resources you want to trace back to the primary energy. Site energy fails to capture that correctly, and I'll tell you why. Site energy only measures how much energy you use at your building. It doesn't measure what energy was used to get you that building. And in electricity, it's a big deal. So let me go back to my favorite chart. Again, primary energy on the left. We use 101 quad in a year. On the right are the four end use sectors. If you look at just these end use sectors and add up how much they used, they only use 76 quad. So 101 quad was used, but they only used 76. Where's the missing 25? The missing 25 is in the electric power sector. The electric power sector is kind of an in-between thing, right? Some of this energy flows into power plants. They make electricity. The electricity gets delivered to the buildings, and the building is only charged for the electricity. And so the missing energy is the waste energy in the power sector. It takes roughly three units of energy at a power plant to make one unit of electricity. A lot of variation across the country, different kinds of energy sources, it varies, but this is the, the, uh, the uh, national average, okay? And 61% of that energy that goes into power plants is fossil fuels even today. So the point is that when we actually try to figure out how much energy buildings are responsible for, it's not just the energy they used, but they're responsible for their two-thirds of that share back at the power plant, right? If the building ceased to exist, the power plants would stop generating their electricity, and instead of saving one unit of energy, they'd save three. When you put all that together, that's how you find that buildings are responsible for about 41 quad, not just the uh, 21 quad listed as site energy. All that electricity has off-site implications. And we want to account for that when we talk about building energy use. You can't just say, oh, if I have an all-electric building and I'm comparing it to an all-gas building, they have different carbon footprints. We need to figure out what that is. But if you ask how much primary energy was this electric building responsible for, well, it depends where the electricity came from, but it could be three times as big when you trace it back. And that's what we want to account for. So, the EPA has defined something called source energy. What it does is it multiplies each of your fuels by a factor which accounts for the off-site use uh, on average in the nation. And in 2016, which is the date I'll be talking about, that factor was 3.14 for electricity. It's 1.05 for natural gas. By the way, I'll also separately talk about greenhouse gas emission, which is really probably more and more important these days anyway. And I'll show you why this really matters, because a lot of people say, I don't know the source site energy, I don't, what's the difference? Most of you have hot water heaters in your home, a domestic hot water heater. I have one in mine, it heats 30 gallons of hot water to be ready for all my uh, showering and laundry needs. Here's pictures of two, one's an electric one on the right, gas on the left. Notice the flu. When you burn gas, you create fumes that have to be exhausted from the house, otherwise you have problems. So there's a flu that takes the, the flu gas out of the house. That is not cold gas, that's hot gas. And so hot gas escapes from the house, therefore you lose energy. Inherently, a natural gas hot water heater is less efficient than an electric one. On the right, 
You don't have to do that. There's nothing to exhaust for electric heat. So you don't have to do that. So right off the bat, natural gas is less efficient. And the annual use here is shown. Uh, the gas one would use 242 therms of gas. If you figure out the site energy, that's about 24, uh, 25,000 kilo BTU is about the, the uh, energy, site energy that goes into that gas. On the right hand side is the electric water heater. It only uses about 16,000 kilo BTU, much less energy, much less energy. And so if that's your metric, you'd say, hey, that electric hot water heater is more efficient. The trouble is, if you trace that back to the electric power, it, on average, it takes 3.14 units of some kind of fuel to make electricity. And so if you trace that back, for the electric one, it's 49,600 kilobtu is the actual primary energy consumed on average. For the natural gas, it's only a 1.05 factor. There is some loss in, in bringing gas to the home, but not near as much. And so the source energy for the gas one is 26,000 kilobtu. It's nearly double that for the electric one. And incidentally, if you look at the energy guide, you'll see that shows up in the estimated cost of operation. The estimated cost of the electric one is nearly double of the gas because of that. Because of that. It's related to fuel prices, but it's also related to what the, you trace them back. So it turns out source energy which is often not used in talking about buildings, is much better indicator of the energy use than is site energy, because it accounts for the off-site stuff. All right, so remember I told you that the average site EUI for all buildings was 80 kilobtu per square foot. The source energy is 186, 186. It's not quite 3.14 times 80 because buildings have a mix of fuels. If you were an all electric building, it would be 3.14 times, but most buildings aren't. Notice for offices, it's 195 kilobtu. Now, you probably don't remember my other slide, but before I showed you the site energy for offices was lower than the average commercial building. And now I'm telling you the source energy is higher than the average commercial building. What does that tell you about offices? They use, relatively speaking, more electricity than the average commercial building, right? So that's what it tells you. Um, for when we're talking about one building, then we'll talk about the site EUI and the source EUI. When we talk about a collection of buildings, we'll talk about the gross EUI. That is, we'll add up all the source energy for all the buildings add up all the floor area, and the ratio will then stand for, it's called the gross EUI for that building. I think I've told you all I need to tell you pretty much about the metrics. We'll talk a little bit about uh, comparing two sets later. But early on, in about 2003, somebody named name Greg Katz wrote a paper that estimated all of the energy savings for lead buildings. And that paper became kind of gospel. They saved 25 to 30 percent energy based entirely on design team projections. There was no data in that whatsoever. In 2006, the U.S. Green Building Council decided they needed to do a study to find out were they really saving energy or not. So they contracted with the New Buildings Institute to perform a study of lead buildings and so in 2008, NBI published their report. It was a study of 121 lead buildings. And they concluded that there was a lot of variability, but on average, lead buildings were saving 25 to 30% in energy. But there are lots of problems with that study. First of all, it was paid for by the US Green Building Council, the, the organization that had a uh, horse in the race. Yeah. Second, there were small numbers of buildings and there was a bias in the selection process. They went out to gather data from about 560 buildings, but only 121 submitted their data. It was all voluntary, and so it's skewed by the self-selection process. Henry Gifford, by the way, is a well-known uh, engineer in New York City. Henry Gifford uh, likened this kind of survey as a voluntary breathalyzer test. 
<laughs> Police set up a breathalyzer test by the side of the highway and they volunteer, they ask you to voluntarily stop and test your breath, breath, <laughs> breath, and they find nobody's drinking. Isn't that amazing, right? Um, the other thing about the study is there was no statement of statistical significance in the study. It looked only at site energy, so it only focused on energy used at the building treating electricity and gas the same. Uh, and there were some other problems with the study. After the study was published, I had the uh, chance to get a copy of the data from Kathy Turner. Kathy Turner was an author of the study, and to her credit, she was willing to give me their Excel file and say, you can analyze it yourself, just let us know what you find out. That was about the only criteria. So I did. I wrote two papers, actually. One was a conference paper that nobody noticed, and the other was a paper in Energy and Buildings. Uh, looking at how NBI had analyzed their data because there were lots of problems. The skewed process of getting data is one I've mentioned. There's some other issues there too, but I'll skip over that. There were some mathematical errors in the study and inconsistencies. When I corrected for those, I concluded that lead buildings in this study we're saving 10 or 15% in energy on site, depending on which subset I looked at, compared to non, to, to non lead buildings, comparable non lead buildings. But the more important thing that I did was I looked at source energy. I said, well, let's also include off site energy use, look at source energy. And what I found was that even in these volunteer data, which probably are better than the buildings that weren't volunteered, there was no evidence for any statistical uh, significant savings in source energy. Yes, they were looking like they saved energy because on site they were saving energy, but not when you include the off site. That was, the, that was kind of the, what we knew at the end of 2009. Now I mentioned the biggest problem, but by the way, 25,000 LEED certified buildings in that study had 121 buildings in it. Right? That's a tiny subset. And since the decade since, there's been several other studies that are fairly small, you know? 10 buildings, 20 buildings, all having the same kind of problem. The problem is getting access to data. I can tell you right now, if I were to write a letter to 500 LEED certified building owners and say, would you please provide me with data that I can use in a study, they wouldn't even respond to my letter. If they did, the first thing they said is, can we um, you know, have veto power on what you write? <laughs> That's changing. It's changing because of municipal building energy benchmarking programs. There's an organization uh, centered, I think it's centered here in DC, Institute for Market Transformation, IMT. Yeah. They have been working with many city governments. Uh, you probably know, city governments are tired of the fact that the federal government won't do anything. And so large cities have said, you know, we will address climate change. And so IMT has been working with about 20 different cities to uh, develop these benchmarking laws. So cities have passed laws that require all large buildings to report their energy use to the city. And in many cases, these data are being put on the web. So what used to be very secret is now becoming quite open. The first of these data were published by New York City in 2011. The cities that, that I'm gonna talk about today, there are 10 cities. Uh, New York City is the first one we did a study in. Uh, Washington, D.C. is in the study I'll talk about today, but I haven't written a paper on it yet. Uh, Boston, Chicago, I have written a paper on Chicago data. Uh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Seattle, Minneapolis, Portland, and Denver. So those are the 10 cities. All 10 of those cities have passed these ordinances and have collected data and are publicly making them available for buildings. From these 10 cities, the data that we've gathered is 2016 data. Uh, we have data for 28,500 some buildings, representing 5 billion gross square feet. It is a huge, huge window into building energy performance. I hope that you are enjoying the detailed lecture presented to you by the Arlington Green Party and Eco Action Arlington in collaboration with Arlington Independent Media and the Sustainable Scoop.
We'll continue now with more on green building research conducted by Professor Schofield of Oberlin College. Now, part two. Be ready to take notes. The cities that, that I'm going to talk about today, there are 10 cities. Uh, New York City is the first one we did a study in. Uh, Washington, D.C. is in the study I'll talk about today, but I haven't written a paper on it yet. Uh, Boston, Chicago, I have written a paper on Chicago data. Uh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Seattle, Minneapolis, Portland, and Denver. So those are the 10 cities. All 10 of those cities have passed these ordinances and have collected data and are publicly making them available for buildings. From these 10 cities, the data that we've gathered is 2016 data. Uh, we have data for 28,500 some buildings, representing 5 billion gross square feet. It is a huge, huge window into building energy performance. What they're publishing is the address of the building, the size of the building, the activity, it's an office building or a hospital, what kind of activity it is, the site energy that we've talked about, and also the source energy, which I've talked about, water use and greenhouse gas emission associated with that, something called the Energy Star Score, I may or may not be able to talk about that much, and the year the building was built. Some of the cities are publishing some other data, but this is kind of the core that they're all publishing. It's an unprecedented access to building energy data. And I have to give credit to an uh, independent writer, Sam Rodman. I got, a, I got an email from this guy I had never heard of, Sam Rodman, in 2012 saying, hey, Dr. Schofield, I see you're interested in lead building. Did you know that New York City has published a bunch of uh, energy data? And he said, and, and I cross-listed it and found a bunch of lead buildings. Are you interested? And that was the beginning of a real rich uh, place to find data for my research. So I'm now going to talk about what we found from these data. And what, you know, what makes these data special are, I just have to emphasize, the original study done by NBI, they got data from 121 buildings, all kinds of different buildings. Some were offices, libraries, laboratories, hospitals. They were spread out all over the country. Even a couple were in Canada. They weren't even from the same year. One was like 2006, one was 2007, one was 2005. So to try to actually gather a, a coherent understanding from this wide group of data, and what do you compare the buildings with? This is all data from the same year in the same geography, same rental market, and broken out by kinds of buildings. And so it's just got so much more comparative value. The first paper was from New York City. We identified only 21 LEED certified office buildings in those data. That doesn't seem like much. In the NBI study, there were 35 office buildings spread out in 48 states. Well, it must be in 35 states. No, I'm sure they were spread out in probably only six or seven states. Here's 21 within a 20 mile radius of each other, right? So you have, we also had almost a thousand non lead office buildings to compare them with from the same area. And what we found was in these data, on average, there was no energy savings for the lead certified office buildings and no source energy, site energy, and no greenhouse gas savings. The lead office buildings performed pretty much the same as the other office buildings. That's what we found in the 2011 data. We did find their lead, uh, their uh, Energy Star scores were 10 points higher. But the point is that this is an apples to apples comparison. I have offices, I can compare to other offices. A few years later, we did the same kind of study in Chicago. Chicago is way ahead in New York in terms of its green building policies. We found a lot more lead buildings in Chicago. They were not ahead in terms of releasing their data. They were a few years behind. And we use this time, uh, the way we match, by the way, the way we match up buildings is we have this list of all these benchmark buildings in Chicago. We have all their addresses and information about them. There's no box there that says this is a lead building. Then we download from the U.S. Green Building 
uh, council's website another list of all the LEED certified buildings in the country, broken out by state and hopefully city, and we cross list addresses. And it's a painful process. We got a little better at it this time. We use GPS coordinates. So we use a geocoding program to help identify the addresses and match them up. And here we found 132 LEED buildings in these data, 84 offices. But now we had not just offices, we also had multifamily housing, big apartment buildings, and some K-12 schools, some, some uh, you know, junior high, senior high schools. And what we found was quite similar to what we found in New York City. The lead offices and the multifamily housing saved no source energy that we could find. Lead schools use 17% more source energy than the other schools. And here I have to pause and say, you know, Chicago schools are pretty old and run down. I'm going to guess each one of those lead schools was a much nicer place to learn than the average Chicago school. So when I say they use more energy, you say, oh my God, but they were much better schools, right? So that's the conundrum here. We do want to make better buildings, but at what expense? And again, we found no savings in greenhouse gas emission for uh, these buildings. But we did find that the offices in the multifamily housing lead did save energy on site. In other words, what you're seeing is if they save energy on site, but they're not saving source energy, the explanation is what you suggested. They're using relatively more electricity. They're, they're using less gas and more electricity, so that's how you're coming up with this, this conundrum. One other thing is we did a regression to see on year built, and what we found was that the lead buildings of all classes were similar to other new buildings. So those schools, those lead schools that use more energy than the average school, that difference went away if you only compare them to other new schools. So they were similar to other new schools. But the bottom line, and, and now it's not so much site energy and source energy. The thing that I think is probably the most important is carbon emission, greenhouse gas. What we found was there was just no evidence at all that lead buildings were saving greenhouse gas emission, reducing it, or primary energy. All right, let me bring it to where we are today because that was old stuff, meaning uh, uh, 2011 in New York City. That's what, nine years ago, New York City data. Uh, the 2015 Chicago data was four years ago. We have now gathered, as I said, data from 10 different cities, Chicago and New York being among them, but now eight other cities. More than 28,000 properties, a uh, total of 5 billion square feet. In these, we have found 861 LEED certified buildings. And when I say we found 861, I don't mean we found every LEED building. It's a hard thing to, to identify these buildings. Some of them are LEED certified under confidential rules, and their address isn't even published. So that's hard to find. Um, the other thing is that there are more LEED buildings, but they weren't certified before the energy data was recorded. So right, this is 2016 energy data. And if a building was certified in 2018, that has nothing to do with how it performed in 2016, right? If it's a, 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 a renovated building. So these are buildings that were certified by June 30th of 2016. And that was an arbitrary cutoff we chose because there's a lot of paperwork and leads, so you know it takes a long time to get them certified. But this is the largest lead study ever conducted. You know, this this is this is what uh, six times bigger than NBI did back in 2008. It's the biggest study ever conducted. In here, there are 545 offices, 107 multifamily housing, there are 40 K-12 schools. 70% of the floor area in these uh, buildings are in those three, three categories. What I'm gonna do is talk only about the office data going forward. I can tell you more about the multifamily housing and the uh, schools, but because there's so many offices, it's the biggest single kind of building type that we can talk about, and so the data is much more robust. So let me begin by just kind of walking you through some of the data, and I will show some graphs. So these are bar graphs that show the site 
energy intensity for offices in these 10 cities and then in aggregate up at the top. And I'll call your attention to a couple of features. First of all, that CBEX, uh, uh, I told you before, I, I'm using this phrase CBEX, uh, I told you before we know that for all commercial buildings there was a 2012 government survey that determined that the average site energy for offices in 2012 was 77 uh, kilobtu per square foot. Um, that was one of the slides I skipped, but that number I told you before, that number is this red line. And you probably don't remember, but it's plus or minus five. There's actually uncertainty in that survey. Very consistent with what we have for all the offices in these 10 cities. It's like 77, which is within that error bar, the same number. So we find the aggregate energy is about the same as what this study was in 2012. Also, 72% of the site energy used by all offices is electricity. About three-fourths of its electricity, one-fourth is something else. New York City has the largest site energy intensity. You see the bar graphs, the biggest. It's out here at 90 or so. You'll also see it uses relatively less electricity than does the national average. New York City is a cold city. They, use, they have a lot of district heat. In contrast, Seattle and LA, they use less energy than the average. You see the site energy here for the national average, they're down lower. And they use relatively more electricity for good reason, right? LA doesn't use a lot of heating energy. It's mostly air conditioning. And the electric grid's pretty green in California, and it's very green in Seattle. Seattle has a lot of hydropower, so they encourage electricity. So they use a lot of electricity uh, relative to other fuels. DC is a little bit weird. Um, DC has lower than average site energy, but much more electricity on average than other buildings, offices. And I don't know why that is exactly. Maybe that's the Pentagon or something like that. I don't know. But, <laughs> No, actually, federal buildings are not included in this, by the way. Well, let's compare lead to non-lead, because that's really what I want to do. So these green bars are, for each of the 10 cities, represent the average for the lead buildings, offices. The red are the average for the non-lead. And then the final set is in aggregate. And what you see is that in every city, in every city, lead buildings, offices use less site energy than do non-lead, right? So they're saving energy on site. And that's true in every city. If you actually look at the aggregate, the aggregate is saving 11%. In aggregate, lead buildings offices save 11% site energy compared to other offices. And, and you can take that to the bank. That has a p-value for those who do statistics less than 10 to the minus 4. So that's a very uh, uh, statistically uh -huh. significant result. This is the same data, but showing you in a different way. Now, I'm not showing you the average for lead or for non-lead. I'm showing you the difference. And the error bar shows the uncertainty in the difference. And so you see, this is the lead site energy savings. Every one of these shows you how much lead are saving in site EUI. And the error bar shows you how well we know this number. And again, it just shows you that Pretty reliably, it looks to me like lead buildings are saving energy on site. This is source energy. Same thing, I'm just showing you the difference. And again, in every city and in aggregate, you're seeing now that lead buildings seem to be saving source energy compared to non-lead. Now, this includes Chicago and New York City, which I've already published papers saying they weren't. So is it inconsistent or is it consistent? Well, look at New York City, for instance. New York City is saving a little bit of source energy with a big error bar. Those of you who are used to doing T values, you'll see that's not going to be a very, very large P value. So that's not statistically very significant. Look at Chicago. Even worse. The error bar is so big that we cannot say with great certainty that it rules out zero. So these are a little bit better than what I had when I did the study. But on the other hand, New York City is now 2016, five years along. New York City's been trying to improve the buildings. So 
what I would say is it looks to me that New York City buildings lead are performing a little better, but it's still not a very convincing amount. And in Chicago, it's not very convincing at all. But in many of the other cities, it is, particularly uh, Washington, D.C., for instance. Here we find that in aggregate, one of the nice things about aggregating the data is maybe you don't have enough numbers of buildings in Minneapolis to draw a very good conclusion. The data is too few. Maybe not enough in Seattle. But when you put them all together, you're building up more statistical confidence. And so what we find is that with a good p-value, LEED are saving 7% in source energy. 7%. Okay, 7% in source energy. Now, I have a dozen more graphs, but I'm going to skip them and get to a table which summarizes. I've looked at five metrics. Site energy intensity is the one I've talked a lot about. Source energy intensity. I've also looked at greenhouse gas intensity, which is the one we really care about. And we've looked at electric and non-electric intensity. Because, <coughs> as I mentioned before, the reason source energy goes, doesn't go down and site energy does is must be more electricity. And so let me show you the aggregate results. Uh, by the way, the color code here has to do with how statistically confident am I in the result. If it's black, I'm not at all confident. That's a bad result, or that's a result that's not very confident. If it's a white background, we're confident. So I'm looking at the aggregate. If you look at the aggregate line here, in aggregate, lead offices are saving 11%. This is the percentage that they're saving compared to other offices, 11%. And it's a white background. I've already told you, that's a statistically significant number. The, green, uh, the electric and non-electric are a little bit curious. The electric is not that significant. It's, it's, it's suggestive, but only 5% saving in electricity and not real confident. Look at the saving in non-electric, 26%. So they're saving non-electric energy, but they're not saving electric energy very much. And then greenhouse gas and source energy, both 7%. This is the first paper. I, I haven't published this paper, which is one reason why I can't necessarily give away the slides. Um, but I will be publishing this paper. It's the first paper I've published out of about four that said lead buildings are saving primary energy and greenhouse gas emission. That's a positive outcome. And it turns out the first, two build the first two cities I studied are among the worst, New York and Chicago. So that's encouraging. But what's discouraging is how little the result is. 7% is way below what the design projections are and way below what we have to achieve if we're going to really make a dent uh, in the greenhouse gas emission that's causing climate change. I'll show you one quick slide, um, and then I'll go on. We, we can break this down by level of certification. Certified, lead, silver, lead gold, and lead platinum. So this is just a summary there. The lead, lead silver basically don't do diddly squat. They say 5% in site energy with no statistical confidence whatsoever, so that's really not any savings. 1% in electric. 16% in non-electric, but look at greenhouse gas and source energy. Lead silver buildings are really no better than other buildings. Okay? I call this the reluctantly green label. This is the building that had to be green because they were mandated to be green, but they sure didn't want to be. So let's, let's put in a bike rack, let's put in a parking place, let's do all those cheap things we can. Lead si silver to me represents the level you do if you have to, but you don't want to. Lead gold are actually getting the most savings. Um, let's see. Uh, greenhouse gas, 8%, slightly more than the lead average. 10% in source energy, 27% in non electric, but 6% in electric. They're doing the best. Lead platinum are doing no better than gold whatsoever. The lead platinum, you'll see. Uh, less greenhouse gas emission. The statistics aren't as good. Uh, but if you look at that, you'll say the only thing that jumps out at you, oh, and I call this the vanity label. Lead platinum's because you want to show off. 
you probably don't care about energy use, but you really want people to think you're green as hell. So that's the vanity label. <clears throat> Look at this one column, non-electric energy. That's the one place these lead buildings are saving. They are reducing non-electric energy use. And this 42% actually matches, these, these numbers match some projected. When you talk to the design team and say, what do you project for your savings? They say, well, 40% for this platinum or 30% for this gold or 20% for the silver. Those numbers are showing up in this one category, but not in the overall energy. All right. So the next question to ask is why? Why aren't we getting a better result? I mean, doing, spending all this money to make LEED certified buildings, they're awarding points for energy efficiency, what's going on? Well, we wanted to test on a building by building basis, how did the energy saved by that building relate to what the design team said it was gonna save? That's what I wanna do, right? I've told you in, in whole or in, in gross, they're not saving that much, but what about a detailed level? Can we find strong correlation? So we found lead scorecards on this website, the Green Building Information Gateway. We found these scorecards, and there we could dig out EAC1 points for a lot of our buildings. And again, for the new construction and core and shell for those newer buildings, that translates into a site energy savings, and we figured out how to translate that into percentage savings. And then for the uh, EBOM, the existing buildings, it translates into a source energy savings through the Energy Star score, and that's kind of a complicated process. But that's, we were able to kind of map those. And then we could graph the measured energy savings for a building versus the predicted, and see how well it looks. This is a graph, this is not that graph. This is a graph I pulled out of a paper by some Harvard authors. They went back over 20 years of lead and they, uh, they also download these EAC1 numbers, and they showed what the design teams predicted. So design teams for certified buildings were predicting year after year about 20% savings. For platinum buildings, we're predicting close to 40%. So these are the numbers the design teams were predicting for their buildings. So what I want to do is make the graph. This is not the graph. This is my thinking about what do I hope to see. What I hope to see is if I plot the projected savings along this axis ver versus the actual measured savings on a building by building basis, what I'm hoping to see is, wow, that's a pretty good predictor. You're, these buildings are saving what you said. Now maybe I won't get quite that good a correlation. Maybe they'll be a little worse. So maybe I'll get a line that looks like this. This has what we call an R squared of 79% meaning that 79% of the vertical variation is predicted by the horizontal variation. Or maybe it'll be even worse. Maybe I'll get something like that. So this is just kind of getting your brain to what we're hoping to see. I'm hoping to see this one, not that one. Here's what I see. This is for 210 lead buildings, only 70, so some of these, 74 of these are offices. These are some of the other data in the set as well. Of the new construction type, there is a 2% R-squared between what they predicted would be the energy savings and what the actual energy savings were. This is, I could do better throwing a dart or wall than this, right? This says there's no relationship whatsoever between the predicted energy savings and what you're seeing. Now that was one kind of building. That was the new construction kind where one methodology. The other methodology uses Energy Star scores and that refers to the existing buildings. There are a lot more of those offices. This is that graph. So this is for existing buildings. There are 455 only lead offices in this data set. This has an R squared of 8%. And again, if you want to know why we're not getting buildings to save energy, that's why. The archers are shooting at the wrong damn target. They're not hitting the target we want them to hit. They're hitting some other target. As I said, we're seeing reduction in non-electric energy. 
But this is an awful methodology if your goal is to save energy. By the way, the total source energy saved, if I add that up, is only about 20% of what was projected. Um, I'll skip that. Let me just wrap up, because I know uh, this has been long. <laughs> what I conclude is lead offices are achieving a 7% primary energy savings and a 7% reduction in greenhouse gas emission. And that means something. That's not zero, which is what my previous papers have published. That is something. But this is way below what the predictions are for lead buildings and way below what we have to accomplish if we really want to address climate change. And the reason is it boils down to this metric that you, the, the target is not being hit because they're not doing the right things. That's the bottom line. And, and I see no evidence, by the way, that NBI report that I criticized so highly that was done 10 years ago, they saw this same thing in their data. And here we are 10 years down the road and nothing's changed. Again, when I look at the levels of certification, I would say gold is the one accomplishing the most. Platinum is not any, no better. Silver is worthless. And what I would say to you is LEED is delivering for its customers mostly what they want. It is my belief that what LEED customers want is a green image. Yeah. And they are willing to pay for it. And the energy, you know, it'd be nice if it saved energy, but that's not really what they want and need. We want to thank Professor Schofield and his team for their detailed research, as well as our sponsors for bringing us together to share these important findings. As a student seeking a career in sustainability, information like those brought to light in this lecture are critical for young people to better navigate and select career choices that will be most useful in solving the climate crisis. It is essential that we track closely the claims of certification programs like LEED to ensure that they meet carbon emission standards necessary to reach the robust energy goals needed to grow durable, resilient cities. I want to thank you for watching this edition of the Sustainable Scoop. Be sure to share and subscribe. You can also find us on Facebook as a group for the Sustainable Scoop, where you can join other members of society who are as interested in sustainability as you are.